And hello, fabulous AP students. This is your favorite teacher, Mr. Jacobson. I am excited to be with you today. Today, we're going to talk about the uh, Washington presidency and also a little bit of the uh, John Adams presidency. It's a new republic. Uh, there's a lot of decisions that need to be made and a lot of policies that need to be determined on how the, the country is going to you know, react, especially in the ideas of domestic and foreign policy. So a lot of things to determine, a lot of things to figure out, and a lot of people to possibly offend, too, in the process. It's American politics, and let us begin. All right, guys, Washington begins his presidency. He has voted unanimously by all the states that were vote, that voted, and uh, he becomes the first president of the United States. He creates his cabinet because he's trying to create this new executive branch, right? And he doesn't really, none, of, none of this has ever been done before, really, people. I mean, this is, this is quite something. So um, everything that everything is new for the most part. Washington is creating an executive branch. He decides to have a cabinet of four other men besides himself. He's got Thomas Jefferson as the Secretary of State. You have Alexander Hamilton as Secretary of Treasury. Henry Knox as the Secretary of War. And Edmund Randolph as Attorney General. And then you have Congress, and they're coming, they're all trying to get things rolling as well. So they're going to. Uh, put together the Judiciary Act of 1789, and this is going to be where they'll establish um, a chief judge and then five associate justices, and that's going to create the highest court in the land. Uh, they're going to rule on the constitution constitutionality of laws and of actions from those laws. You have uh, Alexander Hamilton, who's going to come up with a, an idea to try to get the country back on some economic sound ground uh, because of all the debt that it, it, it accumulated from the Revolutionary War. And, of course, the ineffectiveness of the Articles of Confederation didn't help either. So he's going to say, all right, let's pay off the national debt at face value. And then we'll have the federal government assume all the war debts of the states. So uh, so that was his first plan. He also wanted to protect the nation's new and developing industries. He wanted to collect adequate revenues at the same time by imposing high tariffs on imported goods. So he has a plan. I mean, you know, the anti-federalists probably aren't going to be all that thrilled about it. Um, but, but there is a plan going forth. He also wanted to create a national bank. And that national bank would be used for uh, depo de um, depositing government funds, printing bank notes, and providing basically a stable U.S. currency. So support for this plan came uh, mainly from the northern merchants who, you know, probably could benefit from higher tariffs from a competition. Um, the anti-federalists were not in favor of the plan. They felt like this was giving too much power to the federal government and not enough to the state governments, and, um, and uh, that was concerning to them. Jefferson saw the plan as only benefiting the, the, uh, the rich and at the expense of the indebted farmers. Congress will adopt part of the plan, but they're not going to raise as high tariffs on imports like Alexander Hamilton wanted, which is going to cause another chain re reaction, which we'll talk about later on in, in here in the, uh, the, the webcast. So. The national debt, Jefferson and supporters agreed to Hamilton's assistance on the U.S. government pay off the national debt at face value and assume payment of the war debts of the states. In return, Jefferson's support, Jefferson's support on, his, on this aspect of his plan, Hamilton agreed to Jefferson's idea that the nation's capital should be um, along the Potomac River later called Washington, D.C. after George Washington's death. So there's some, there's some negotiations and compromises happening here. The National Bank, on the other hand, Jefferson did not like it. He felt like it was the Constitution did not give Congress the power to create a bank of, of, like this. He wanted privately owned banks. Um, Hamilton disagreed, believing that the necessary and proper clause of the Constitution authorized Congress to do whatever was necessary to carry out 
its enumerated powers. So Washington supported Hamilton on the issue, and the proposed bank was voted into law. Federal government would charter the bank, and it would remain privately owned. Now, the federal government could print currency and use federal deposits to stimulate businesses. Now, on the foreign affairs issue, um, Washington kind of had was caught between a rock and a hard place, right? Because you have, as a result of the success of the American Revolution, you have the French Revolution happening, and that is uh, that that's all the way in Europe, and of course, the people who are fighting the French monarchy are inspired by Enlightenment ideas, just like the American Revolution was and uh, naturally there are people in america that felt like we should support the french in their revolution this the, they're trying to do the same thing we did they're trying to get out of the thumb of oppression and uh washington was very hesitant he did not feel like the country was he just felt like it was a young nation um he didn't feel like it was ready to get into a european war let alone all the the um, entanglements that come from European politics. He just, he did not feel good about it. And so he did something that was rather unpopular. Nevertheless, he stuck to his guns on this. He created the proclamation of neutrality. And he basically said, we're neutral. We're not getting involved. We'll trade with France. We'll trade with Britain. We'll trade with anybody who wants to trade with us but we're not going to get involved. And that's going to lead to um, citizen Edmond uh, Jeannette. And he is a French diplomat who's going to go over to America to try to rally support, but he's going to do it in unconventional ways. Usually you try to do this by talking to the leadership uh, and getting their support, but he started going directly to the people of America and doing some outrageous and unruly things which is even going to cause um, the French government to kind of say, yeah, let, let, you should remove him. We, we're, we're going to remove him too. So Jeanette is, is uh, in the end, is going to remain in, in America. He's going to marry in America. He's going to eventually become a U.S. citizen in America. But uh, anyway, there's more going on in Washington's presidency under foreign affairs. You got the Jay Treaty. So Washington sends Chief Justice John Jay to Britain to discuss two concerns. First, Britain continues to occupy the posts on the U.S. western frontier, which they said they, which in the Treaty of Paris they were supposed to not. And second, Britain would search and seize American ships and impress seamen into a British Navy. And so John. Uh, John Jay was was sent to go discuss these things. After a year of negotiations, they come up with the the Jay Treaty, uh, which wasn't very strong. But um, anyway, so the British agreed to to adhere to the first um, concern, which was the the British continued to occupy posts and forts in the frontier. However, they said nothing about. The second one, which means they basically said, you know, forget you guys. We're going to do what we want in that regard. So the J, the J Treaty was looked at as highly controversial because it, 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 got, it narrowly got passed by the Senate. Now, the Pickney uh, Treaty is yet another thing under foreign affairs under Washington. With the J Treaty, then Spain is looking and going like, wait a minute, are they starting to chum up to the British? Because we're not good friends with the British. They're kind of like our sworn enemies. If you know anything about world history, Spain and Britain do not have a good past. Um, so anyway, so <clears throat> the, the Pickney Treaty with Spain comes about. And what that means is Spain's looking at, at America kind of getting closer to British and they don't like that, so they're trying to, to sweeten the deal as well to, to kind of keep America in their good graces as well. And, and, and so they want to keep, they want to keep things uh, going well, okay? So the, the Spanish agree to allow the, the Americans to trade on the lower Mississippi and the New Orleans without paying duties. So down here, this is where 
they can trade. They also can, uh, they have the right of deposit, which means Americans could transfer to cargo into New Orleans without paying duties. And then Spain, they finally accepted the Florida's boundary should be at the 31st here. You see this little piece? So, so at the 31st is the, the boundary line. Um, and that will be finally agreed upon. So all this would be kind of like Spain, uh, Florida, right? And that also is a corridor to the Mississippi River, um, which is also very important for trade. So America is going to have access to this now. So we have domestic con concerns happening as well. Conflict is going to continue to arise as, as settlers continue to move west. The Alleghenies, um, which we talked about in previous ones, American Indians aren't going to like that. It's going to lead to conflict. You're going to get the Northwest Confederacy that's going to cre be created. And uh, there's going to be a, a leader under, under the Miami war chief, Little Turtle. And... Um, and this is going to lead to bloody victories. Um, they're even going to find out that the British were secretly supplying um, the Indians, the American Indians, to attack the colonists, which doesn't go well uh, for, for the Americans and, uh, when they view the British. Um, there's going to be a, a uh, battle. It's going to be the Battle of Fallen Timbers at, in the northwestern I of uh, Ohio, um, that's where they're going to crush the Confederacy. A year later, the, the Treaty of Greenville was, was signed, and they surrendered claims to the Ohio Territory and promised to open it to settlement. Now, domestic, uh, more domestic concerns happening. You got the Whiskey Rebellion. So remember I told you about um, we had uh, the, uh, what was it? It was... Um, the plan that that Hamilton had where he said we need to raise tariffs on imported goods as well as, you know, create that national bank and, 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 and protect all the businesses that are vital to our, our, our country and its well-being. They, he wanted to raise import uh, tariffs on imported goods, right? And Congress agreed, but they didn't want to make the import tariff percentage as high as what Hamilton wanted. So as a result, Hamilton's like, well, now I got to find another way to try to, you know, pull some money for revenue for the state, for, for the federal government. So what they started doing is they decided they were going to tax whiskey. Um, and, uh, and in Western Pennsylvania, a group of farmers refused to pay the tax and even would attack revenue collectors. So uh, you have what's called the Whiskey Rebellion, and it's a result of uh, you know the federal government needing more money because they didn't get all the it, they couldn't raise the taxes as high as they wanted to for tariffs for imported goods. So now Washington has to put down this rebellion because he can't. I mean, we can't allow insurrection like this and unruliness, and so. Washington sent 15,000 state militia under Alexander Hamilton's command, and they just absolutely crushed the rebellion without, with hardly any bloodshed. And that's significant, because if you look here, some Americans applaud the action, contrasting it with the previous government's helplessness to do anything about Shays' Rebellion. So if you remember Shays' Rebellion under the, um, the Articles of Confederation, there wasn't a whole lot that, that the states could do. Um, they, they, they just kept running around, running amok, and, and they couldn't amass that kind of army or, or power so quickly, you know, because of the weakness of the Articles of Confederation. Um, but now, with the, with the U.S. Constitution, that gives the executive branch a chance to just knock it out immediately. He amassed 15,000 men. There's no way that any rebellion uh, like that was going to, you know, overcome 15,000 trained state militia. And thank goodness it was a, you know, it was virtually bloodless in, in essence. Um, so among Westerners, however, the military action was widely resented and condemned as an unwarranted use of force against the common people. 
the government's chief critic, Thomas Jefferson, gained in popularity as a champion of the Western frontier. So we have first political parties starting to emerge. Remember, Washington didn't like political parties. He didn't want political parties, and he did not affiliate with any political parties. Doesn't mean he didn't agree with ideas of political parties, but he did not want to be. He he didn't want that that um, that tribalism. Uh, he didn't feel like it would be a healthy thing in the long run for the country. However, despite what he wanted, you do have the Federalists and the Anti-Federalists that emerged as the two dominant parties, and they're going to keep going at it. The two figureheads, one will be Hamilton for the Federalists. And Jefferson for the Anti-Federalists. Um, the Anti-Federalists will be known as the Democrat, Democratic Republican Party. Federalist Party will obviously be Federalists. Um, and they're going to oppose each other, especially after the French Revolutionary. It, um, it's going, the French Revolution is going to cause a dividing line, right? Uh, some Americans will have very strong feelings about this, and it's further going to... Um, it's going to allow Jefferson to openly challenge Washington's neutrality policy. So Washington will serve for two terms, and then that's it. He will willingly step down from office and from power. And people were amazed that this happened. Um... I, I, I believe it was uh, the King of England when he heard that he had stepped down only after two terms. Um, he, he made a mention saying that Washington could be the very, very well the greatest man that ever lived in this generation. Because in history, we don't see that happen a lot. We don't see people, once they've had that power and that fame and that glory, um, it, it's a rush. It's a hit. And people, when they get power, are not willing to give it up so easily. And to see a man who uh, could have been so justified and just living out all his days as president um, based on what he did for the country, how he scolded in the hot sun during the revolution with his men, how he froze in the bitter cold of, of uh, the deepest, darkest parts of, of the Revolutionary Valley Forge. Um, this man could have easily just taken it, and people, I mean, they want, they were willing to make him a king, for crying out loud. And then he said, look, we didn't sp take, you know, seven, eight years to try to kick out King George III, so we just put in King George I. So Washington, it was a rare breed. And uh, as a result, he is only going to serve two terms and he will willingly step down. And in honor of Washington and his example, every other president will do this very same thing until the president that broke it, which is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And he will uh, break it and that will be very concerning to people. Um, and so in 1950, you will have the 22nd Amendment, which will make the President of the United States term in office only two terms, period. So what does all this mean going forward? Washington is out. He wants to give his, his last advice to the Republic, which he, he, he fought for. And then he led and guided to the best of his ability. So what does he say? He says, one, do not get involved in European affairs. Two, do not make permanent alliances in foreign affairs. Do not form political parties and do not fall into sectionalism or tribalism. Anyway. Okay, we are going to move forward now. John Adams is going to become the second president of the United States. Um, he's barely going to become president, beating Jefferson by only three electoral votes. That's going to make John Adams president, and according to the Constitution at the time, that's going to make Jefferson as vice president, and they are sworn bitter enemies at this point. Um, so... 
John Adams is going to have the XYZ affair. Basically, he sent American uh, delegates over to talk to the French. Um, they wanted to discuss why are the French seizing American ships and, um, and try to settle this peacefully, right? So the French ministers were only known as X, Y, and Z. They didn't really, their names weren't revealed. But I guess what happened was that when the when America's uh, delegates tried to meet with them, they basically requested a bribe in order to even enter negotiations. And the Americans were so indignant about that, they refused to do it, which then, you know, <laughs> which then sort of ends negotiations. It makes the French look corrupt. It makes them look like they're unwilling to hear out our pleas. And of course, the the, the, the cries of war and, you know, defend America's honor uh, started going out with Alexander Hamilton being one of those uh, in favor of it. Um, Adams wasn't of the same mind as the Federalists. He he had a cooler head, and he basically just sort of said, we, we don't have a strong enough army or navy at this point to do anything like that. So what he did is he just sent new ministers or delegates uh, to France again, and they renegotiated. And uh, hopefully, you know, that was it. Um, during the John Adams, though, we have the Alien Sedition Acts. These are highly controversial, especially even today. Um, so in 1789, you have the Federalist Party that took uh, the majority of both the House and the Senate or of Congress, right? So because you do that, then you have some pretty strong power because you got Federalists all in, um, in, in, uh, in Congress, in both houses of Congress, and you have a Federalist who's president. So pretty much anything you want to pass, you're likely going to pass unless it's super controversial and not even some Federalists will get on, involved on, um, on board with it. But this did get on board. This is going to um, not make the anti-Federalists happy. It looked as though the Federalist Party was using their power to hurt their political opponents. So one way they did this was the Naturalization Act, which increased from 5 to 14 years required for immigrants to qualify for U.S. citizenship. This hurt the Anti-Federalists because most immigrants were poor farmers and usually sided with the Anti-Federalists or the Democratic-Republican Party. So that did not go well with... Um, with the Anti-Federalists, they also passed the Alien Acts, which authorized the president to deport aliens considered dangerous and to detain enemy aliens in times of war, which they were concerned about that kind of power. And then the Sedition Act was really alarming. You have um, this idea that they made it illegal for newspaper editors to criticize either the president or Congress. And if they did, they would impose these fines or imprisonment could be in order to the editor who violated these laws. So, I mean, that's, that's deeply concerning. Um, even, even today, there'd be a lot of people like, wait a minute here. So the Anti-Federalists, they argued that the Alien Sedition Acts were vi had violated the First Amendment and was therefore unconstitutional. These resolutions by Jefferson and Madison declared that the states had entered into a compact informing the national government. Therefore, if any act of the federal government broke that compact, a state could nullify the federal law. So it's a little bit like, you know, the idea of, um, of, uh, of Rousseau's idea of the social contract, right? Where, uh, nope, we reserve the right of the states to, to annul anything that we see that, um, the federal government is overreaching, so things aren't things are moving ahead, but they're not. It's not all hunky dory, guys. There's a lot of problems, and they're trying to figure this out, especially as a new country. So, anyway, go ahead and write that summary, and we'll talk about that when we when we return. 